Hey guys, uh, well, I wasn't going to do another video, but it's tugging on my heart here. Uh, hi, Travis. I, I got a comment here. I want to clarify. Uh, he said, I, I know Renee says if you constantly doubt, it means you're not saved or something like that. If you heard me say that, I will take blame, but I did not say that. I may need to be clearer. I would never proclaim someone saved or unsaved. I can't, I can't know that. I, I Even if you, there's nothing I can do to, I don't know your heart. Uh, God does. Uh, what I do say is if you've never trusted Christ and you're not saved. I mean, I can say that safely because the scriptures say that. So, uh, no. But I want to address this issue because it seems like you're, you're struggling and, and you're having some pain. And I, I feel like uh, that's what I do. I preach the gospel, I defend it, and I try to keep my brothers and sisters on the right foundation, edified and encouraged, so that we can be strong in our faith and live for the Lord without all these distractions that are constantly uh, trying to tear our faith down. So I, I just want to be a voice that uh, tells them what God says about them and who they are in Christ and the good news of the gospel. So I don't ever want anybody worse off because they came here so uh now if somebody's not saved uh yeah yeah i don't want you comfortable in that uh because god wants you saved too uh but i i'm not going to proclaim somebody's not saved now what i what i did try to and i guess badly say is that a believer that has been around a while should not should not be back and forth with, oh gosh, am I saved? Am I not? That should be something that is resolved. That That's the first thing you need to do. You need to remind yourself on a daily basis what your foundation is and to, if you don't fully understand what was accomplished on Calvary by Jesus, like what, what he accomplished, the victory he has why salvation is based only on his blood, etc., then that needs to be something you need to do. You need to take it to God, sit down with the word. You need to maybe hear a good preacher that you trust and uh, really understand what was accomplished. Because the thing is, a lot of people that send me things about doubt, it is always one of two things. And it's, they've heard a teacher that is either told them if you do x y or z or you don't have x y or z then you're not really saved and then they start questioning them because they've twisted up a verse right and so uh that's either happened or something in their walk is off either they have fallen into a sin they thought they got victory over and they're feeling condemned and so now they're wondering if they're really saved uh, a lot of the Calvinist teaching is causing people to feel unsaved because their version of perseverance of the saints uh, and uh, not preservation, but perseverance um, is confusing to people. So usually there's something going on in the walk of the Christian. And I've said before, your walk is not your standing. Your walk varies from day to day depending on your commitment. Your position or your permanent standing in Christ depends on Jesus's faithfulness. So that's why that's solid. That's why your salvation doesn't change because it's based on something Jesus did already. It can't be undone. Uh, it's, it's based on him, him alone. Um, and you receive it by God's grace through faith in that you, you trust him. So you either believe that Jesus paid your debt, and if he paid for all your sin, which he did, paid for the sin of the whole world, um, and that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, you'd have no reason to wonder why you're saved, because you know he did it, and you know he rose again to prove that he got victory over death, So, uh, and one day you'll be risen too, so there's no reason to doubt salvation, because you can't have faith in your own faith either. You can't go, well, I'm saved because I really believed it. It Something's true or it isn't. And you either believe that what Jesus did on Calvary gave you eternal life because your sin debt's paid and you can't pay, you can't pay it too. 
You can't be double, double jeopardy. It would make God unjust. He's already poured his wrath out on Jesus for you. So he can't pour it out on you. Um, then you shouldn't, you should not be going uh, back and forth. So that I will say you should not. Nobody should be able to shake you. However, I would like to say there was a, somebody here also made a great point. Renewing our minds daily. We're told to do that. And sometimes we can fail to do it and it'll sneak up on us and then shake our faith. It will, it will just shake us up. See, if our salvation, our security is based on anything to do with us, whether it's how good our faith is or how well we're walking or how much we're a disciple or how faithful we are, it is always shaky ground. And there's going to be days where you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm saved. Well, good. Because you shouldn't be basing it on what you're doing or not doing anyway. Um, and if you are, think to yourself, huh, who is my, who, what's my feet standing on right now? Is it standing firmly on the risen, victorious Jesus? Or is it on me? Because honestly, the only time I see people questioning salvation is when they take their feet off of the foundation that is Christ the rock and onto partly what they're doing. Honestly, it's true. And so whenever we fail, like in our walk, or if you fall into a sin, you thought you got victory over, uh, that's what's happening. You're, you're saying, well, part, I thought part of my salvation was secure, partly because I was living better. Well, I mean, you can't really base it on that though. Can you look at the Jehovah's Witnesses? They're not worldly. They don't do these things. They're not saved. Look at Buddhists, how holy they are and set apart. Some of them uh, dedicate their whole lives to just meditation and living poor. They're not saved. So we can't do that. It's got to be on Christ the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand, as the old hymn says. So um, that's, that's the one thing. If you're having that kind of to and fro confusion, you're just on the wrong foundation and renew your mind. Uh, if you don't know exactly how he accomplished, because there's teachers on here all day long, every day, trying to strip you of your security. There's people writing books telling you why you can lose it, why you are you better straighten up and get, because salvation is based on you. And it's nonsense, because the religious world hates the true gospel, and that's what's so dangerous. So, no, no, I did not say that. If I did sound like I was implying that, I'm very sorry. I never want to hurt your faith. Uh, I'm not going to proclaim who's saved and who isn't. But uh, you should not, you should not, as a believer that has been around a while, that understands what salvation is about, you should not be shaken all the time. You should... I mean, if you have it now and then, it's like, hmm, like I was clever and how he twisted that up, got me thinking. Let it work for you. You can say, huh, well, I know I'm saved, but maybe I'm not. Maybe I need some help in this area. Maybe I need to be walking with the Lord a little closer. That's fine. If you want to encourage yourself that way in uh, making, you know, priorities change and uh, having your walk be tighter with God, that's good. That's important. That's productive. But not to... Um, uh, question your salvation because nothing should be making you question whether he saved you or not. And I like what you put here. You said, uh, I believe obviously he died and rose again, but I have a hard time believing he died for me. And there's the key. There's the key. And, you know, sometimes it just takes walking this stuff through in our head and reasoning with God. Um, he did die for you um, and he died for the sins of the whole world and there's a part of us and this is not an insult to you sir I'm just saying there's a way that our self-righteousness masquerades as humility and we don't even know it but to think that he didn't die, he didn't die for mine like mine's too bad or it's a way of hanging on to a little bit of pride I'm sorry I know you don't mean it that way but I just want to let you know that's how the enemy works for instance, it's, uh, you know, well, it feels almost humble to 
think that you're such a bad person that he didn't die for you. To, but it's actually the opposite. Um, he wants us to have confidence in what he did. Uh, and that includes certainly paying for your personal sins. I know that's, um, uh, you know, hard because we all have to have the realization that it it was for you that he was dying that day. And he knows the end from the beginning. He's not shocked by anything we do. Um, and he, he died for us all the same. So the, the greatest thing we can do for God is to take him at his word. If you look at uh, the Hebrews, book of Hebrews, that's what was happening there. He was warning them using Old Testament pictures of what unbelief brought them. Like when they question God, in the wilderness for 40 years. So just take God at his word. Because many of them were not believing that Jesus was the end of the temple system and the animal sacrifice system, that they were all shadows of Jesus. They wanted to still put their trust in the animals and the temples and be part of the Pharisaical you know, sect, but still call themselves Christian. And you, you can't uh, trust both because that, that covenant was over and it was all shadows of Jesus. And so they were mixing old covenant, new covenant stuff, and they were belittling the blood of Jesus. And if they were to willfully sin by rejecting him and going back to the animals, there is no more sacrifice for sin. There remains no more because Christ died once for all. And he, he wants them to have a heart in full assurance of faith, knowing that God has done it already. It's, it's already done. So that's the best thing we can do is to take God at his word. And the warning there in Hebrews 3 is, hey, look what happened to, you know, the things that were written in the old covenant were for our examples. They were to encourage us. So you can see the judgment that came on them was because they didn't believe God. And that was temporal. That's not eternal loss. It's temporal. It happened here on earth. And the same warning is going to the believers there. It's not saying you're going to be eternally losing things. It's saying you're missing out on the rest now. You should be having the promises now. You should be having the peace now. You should be teachers by now, but I have to go back to the beginning. So there's too many places in scripture where people got mixed up. And it didn't say they weren't saved. It didn't say they lost salvation or they weren't saved to begin with. Neither one, which is a cop-out for all these false uh, denominations. So it's Hebrews. If you go over here, I'll, just, I'll show you what I mean. So if you heard me say that, I was not clear. I was not as careful, maybe, as I should have been with my words. And I know uh, I would never want someone to think that. Um but I, I do say, if you've never trusted him and you're constantly going back and forth about him, I saved him, I not, either you're listening to a lot of false teachers or you just did never understand what he actually accomplished by his death, burial, and resurrection. If that's the case, you need to believe the gospel. I like what uh, somebody else also said. I preach the gospel to myself every day. That's beautiful. I do too. I do too. And I play it out. Let it play out in my head. Okay, I'm getting condemned because the enemy likes to uh, bring up stuff. Okay, I'm getting condemned because I did this or the other. So I take it all the way and I go, all right, so I'm going to stand before God and uh, he's going to ask me why I should be in. If I say, because Christ died for me, I'm pleading his blood. Is he going to say, well, that's not enough. I don't think so. They didn't do that at the Passover. You know, the, the angel of death or whatever, when God passed over, the house is covered in the blood. He didn't knock on the door and ask them, were they, you know, being good inside? He saw the blood and passed over them because death had no hold on them. The blood gave them life. It's the same thing for us. Life in the flesh is in the blood. Uh, life of the flesh is in the blood. That's a double meaning. The life is in the blood. It's physical, but the life, eternal life, is in the blood of Christ. So, you see, all this is pictures. And so, we do preach the gospel to ourselves. And we need to do that every day. And that's what you need to be reminded of, because there's so much coming against 
your faith. See, the enemy doesn't want you. He can't take your soul, but he can take your victory and it can keep you from getting anybody else saved or, or being able to witness to help someone get the truth. It, anything to just throw a monkey wrench in God's plan for your life. So if you're in this whirlwind, this merry-go-round of I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm not, you're not confident. You're not going to preach to anybody else because you don't want them to ask you questions because you're confused. You're going to stay right where you are and you won't have any growth. So hopefully that will give you motivation to get off that hamster wheel, to, to get this uh, solid foundation under you and, and ask the Lord to show you, hey, why, why is it just what Jesus did? And it, the scriptures tell us that eternal life is a free gift by his grace through faith in what Jesus has done. That's that's done. I'm going to read some stuff here. Uh, but how we as believers are faithful to the Lord is rewarded or you can suffer loss. But you cannot suffer loss of salvation because you can't be unborn of God. Uh, he knew you from the beginning. He's not going to give somebody to Jesus. He's going to lose later. It doesn't work that way. So um, I've got lots of videos on our eternal standing in Christ. And I think that that's a lot of what people miss. They One, they mix up their righteousness with God's righteousness. Uh, they don't understand imputed righteousness. They mix up discipleship with salvation. They mix up reward with what's a gift. There's a lot of things they mix up and it causes confusion. So Jesus talked about the blind leading the blind. They don't really understand it. They shouldn't be teaching it. So, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry if, if it sounded I said that. I want to be very, very careful how I word things uh, because I don't want anybody to, to you know, think, think that. Because I've actually broken off with people that have made, like, matter of fact statements like that because it, it harmed people's faith and I, I don't want to do that i don't want to give anybody confidence that they're saved when they haven't trusted christ either so i'm just saying i can't know i'm not here to judge somebody's salvation i'm here as a sister in christ to preach the good news and to uh, have a place where we can talk about these things that trouble us and how to get get victory over them you know and to me the best way is just keeping your eyes on jesus just and uh, a bible believer put scrupulosity is that how you say it scrupulosity is the the suffering that martin luther also had i i didn't know that you know when you have these obsessive religious and blasphemous thoughts he said he suffers from it and martin luther did as well well look where his affliction took him right to grace brought him right to grace so god uses all things for the good of those who love him uh, you may suffer some things. You might go through some stuff. But you know what, Travis, and this is to you specifically. Most of this video has just been in general. But to you specifically, maybe the Lord's letting this go on. I, you mentioned some of the teachers you had listened to. I'm concerned about one or two of them. I don't know everything. And I'm just a sister. Um, but I do know that certain teachers can tear you down uh, uh, and really confuse you. But I think God could be using this to bring you to the next level, to get you uh, away from that, wondering about you. Let's get you off of Travis and get you on, on Jesus, just completely trusting him uh, and what he's done. And then that way God can use you for what plan he has for you. And clearly he has one. Uh, I do believe you when you said, you know, I don't care if you believe me or not. I do believe you. I do believe your testimony. I do believe the supernatural things you said you experienced. And um, I have felt things like that, too. And sometimes it's just hard to verbalize. You did a very good job of explaining it. I, I totally understood what you were saying. So um, there is a, a reason, you know, he'll use this, too. So if you're having a tough time and you're struggling, you're back and forth, it'll be used also for good. So uh, you never know. It's good that you reached out. And uh, I never want anybody to feel worse, you know. So. Um, Let's talk about this. Let me go over to Hebrews uh, uh, 5. And it says, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. 
But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And if you continue, it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith tor towards God. And it continues, and this we will do if God permit. So it's about things that accompany salvation here. We've talked about the Hebrews before. It's about, uh, it's, it's a warning about them not losing things that come with or should come with their salvation. And that is the knowledge that they're victorious, that they have been bought. It's done. It's finished. And so I wouldn't say they were never saved, but that they're not walking in the peace and the rest and the joy. John talks about fellowship bringing you full joy when you're walking in good fellowship with God. Part of that is being on the right foundation. But if your fellowship is suffering, which it can't help but suffer if you're constantly wondering whose child you are, that's got to be settled. The, the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith towards God, number one, got to get that out of the way. But then you can move on to perfection. You can move on to the meteor things that you know, God wants every Christian to have and have the stronger faith and so forth and all the things that come with it, the rest, the peace we have, uh, because we know, um, you know, the worst thing anybody can do to us is send us to glory. You know, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to know that death is not death for us. And when we lose somebody we love, we're going to see him again. I mean, it's just a really a comfort. It's a wonderful, I don't know how people function that don't have the Lord and don't have the promise of eternal life, like for sure, because I, I don't know how they function. I don't know how they live. All right. Over in Galatians three, it said he didn't call them unsaved. He just said, who, who tricked you guys? Who, who, who bewitched you? It's like he didn't call them unsaved. I would never call something unsaved because they uh, question, uh, but you shouldn't be tormented like this in and out of doubt it's because you need to get on the right foundation. You need to renew your mind daily, just like all of us do. You're not lacking anything. You just got one foot off of the foundation, which is Jesus in Calvary. And you got one foot over here for discipleship that should be over here firmly planted with the other one on the foundation of Jesus. So when you take that off of it being just about him and move it over here into the discipleship or service or uh, your faithfulness area, then you're going to get rocky uh, because it's not standing firmly on Christ. And you build on that foundation. But if, if not, you're wobbly. And so that's what's happening right now. You're just partly wobbly because you're partly stepping off the solid foundation because you you stopped, you, you, you started to focus on your fellowship, your walk as a Christian. And, oh, and by the way, uh, you know, you were saying, well, I was doing all this great stuff and I, you know, I knew I was safe. Well, ha ha, I want to back you up there. Maybe God's, maybe God's doing this. Okay. It, it's just why I say this, because if you're feeling great, like uh, I know I'm safe because I'm this, that, and the other still on the wrong foundation. See, because that means your salvation is going to be secure when you're doing what you perceive as good and faithful work in the Lord, good and faithful living in the Lord, like you're abstaining from sin that you uh, d used to do or something. That's wrong too. You don't want to be over there either in the pride camp. So that's why it's so important to not make salvation based on us because it's going to take you two places. It's going to take you into torment and confusion and doubt. And then it's going to take you over into the self-righteousness. I'm not calling you self-righteous. I'm just saying that's the two places that uh, it can take us. Okay. So maybe, maybe it's good. Maybe it's good that you came here. Maybe uh, it's good that you were shaken up because you, it, it never, you should never feel great. Uh, like you're, I know I'm safe because of your own performance. Shouldn't because what happens when that performance, you, you mess up. Am I not really saying really say so you can't, you can't, it's gotta be unmoving. And the only thing unmoving and unchangeable is God. And so your salvation is unmoving and unchangeable because it's based on him, not you. That, that's what it's got to stay there. All right. 
uh, in Galatians 3, it says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It's like they, they would put on a spell over you or something because you should, it said that you should not obey the truth. Like you started, you were, you were over here trusting in what Jesus did. And then the next thing I know, you're trusting something else. What in the world that you should not obey the truth means maintain the truth that I taught you, which is that Christ died for sins. According to the scripture, you're saved by grace through faith and what he did, not in yourself. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. So it's as if he was right there. You saw the You know what it accomplished. Only this would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit, capital S Spirit there, by the works of the law or the hearing of faith. Every time somebody gets saved here and you see them receive the Spirit, the Spirit comes right as the belief in what the person's preaching happens so they're preaching about jesus in the old testament that's him that's a picture of him that's a picture the prophets all talked about it and then as he promised he died and was buried again he paid for your sins they believe it and the spirit falls right in the middle every time they're not doing anything they're not making a promise to god they're not confessing and repenting of every sin they can think of they're focusing on jesus and look that's him in the old covenant all those prophets talked about him and they see it. Their eyes are open and spirit falls. That's how you see every person get the spirit because they hear the faith by the spirit of the, the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth you in the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So all the stuff that was manifesting, all the gifts and healings and everything, was that being done because they were keeping the law? No. Because they had the faith of Christ. They kept the faith of Christ. The uh the uh, the faith is the faith of Christ, the believers in Jesus. That's why. That's why. He therefore that ministered, do we do it by the work of the law, by hearing of the faith, even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which of the faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So they were trying to say, you got to be circumcised and become a Jew in order to be saved. And he's like, no, Abraham's children are those that believe. They're believers. Jew, Jew and Gentile believers. That's who's uh, children that you hear more. So, because uh, they were saying, you know, you got to become a Jew in order to be, so you get the blessings. Abe, no, you don't. Because the seed of Christ, I mean, the seed of Abraham is Jesus. And then when you're in him, you get all the blessings uh, 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 are yea and amen in Christ. So, we see here that this group had fallen away from the right foundation. So it's, you know, they're not unsaved. They're just losing out. When it says fallen from grace, it doesn't mean you've uh, lost your salvation. Uh, it, it means you have fallen away from walking under his grace and relying upon God to relying upon self and now are trying to earn it somehow, merit it somehow. And so, you know, we don't want to do that. That's, that's, that's not how we walk. It's not how we begin, and it's not how we want to continue to go, and it's not going to help us grow. So you see here in Scripture, this happens. There's some people like Hymenaeus and Philetus who had uh, overthrown the faith of some. You see some that come in and trouble you and would pervert the gospel. It's troubling how many, how many people work against the gospel message. Work against it. It's unbelievable to me. I never thought I'd see the day. I did not realize there was that much opposition against the truth of the gospel until I got into this. So anyway, I just want to show you those couple of things. It does happen. But every time, every time the reason is the confusion and the doubt comes in because they're stepping off the right foundation. They're starting to stand on their own foundation. So I just want to leave you with this. This is a little edification from uh, Ephesians 1. Uh, oh, if you want to read more on the Hebrews thing, uh, you know, where he's warning them using the Old Testament examples of uh, about 
you know, he did, they didn't enter the promised land. So he's using it as a parallel to encourage them, to show them what happens you, when you don't believe God. Okay. So he's just saying, Hey, Jesus did it all. It's done. It's finished. You need to believe him. Cause I said, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, he's talking about your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved in that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. See, they didn't enter the promised land uh, because they didn't believe God after everything they had, he had proved to them and they still wouldn't believe him. And so they didn't lose salvation. The promised land is a picture of the rest, the peace inside that they have. And that's what the people here are going to miss out on. These Hebrews are going to miss out on that peace, that promised land inside, that rest of knowing. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Again, not about salvific loss, but about fellowship. Okay? All right. So then it says, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So, uh, and, and to whom he swear that he should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So they could not enter in because of unbelief. So uh, that here also is just a warning to the Hebrew people not to uh, reject Christ. Don't reject the gospel message. But this here, it's too long to explain, is a warning of temporal loss, things that come with salvation, not salvation itself. Um, and it's a great eternal security book if you understand the context that way. Um, but you see here that the peace, that the rest that God wants us to have, so he doesn't want us troubled on every side, wondering if we're his child. He didn't want any of that. He calls it an evil heart of unbelief. So don't let anybody tell you that that's what God wants. You constantly want, oh, it's a sin of presumption to say, you know, you're going. No, it's not. It's called faith and it's counted to us for righteousness, Mr. Pope. So you can't listen to church. You can't listen to me. You can't listen to anybody unless we're telling you what this scripture says in context. Then, then it's okay. But you got to take it to God and check what he says and, uh, and confirm it by the word, by the word, always. So I wanted to show you this happened. Even in the early church, people uh, got confused. They got off the right foundation. You're not alone here. All of us do it. I've even had teachers, as long as I've been doing this, say things so cleverly that I have to go, what? And then like, it'll hit me and then I'll, I'll go, oh, this doesn't mean that. Why am I letting them do that? Like they get to, like to me, and it was, I, I know you can be shaken, you know? So uh, I don't feel bad. We can all get there, especially if I'm too busy and I'm not spending the time I should, you know, be still and know that I am God. That's my hardest part. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm weak in certain areas myself. So, um, we all have a uh, room to grow in. Uh, that's true. So I want to read you some Ephesians here uh, before I go. So, uh, Charis, I hope I hope that you know uh, there are wonderful people here on this channel, and you see some of them reached out to you. Um, and uh, I'm a member of the Church of the Eternally Secure. We're going to be starting that up soon on Sundays and Wednesdays and live stream again. That's what I'm working on now, trying to figure out the best program to use. Um, so you're welcome to come to the CES channel when we get that going. But you're welcome here. I have some wonderful viewers, and they all help each other, and they're they're really great. So hopefully I can um, encourage you a little bit, and he will help you get through this tough spot. But you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Just get your feet back on the right foundation. That's all. You know, when, you, when you're focused only on him for your salvation, you can have the joy and the peace, and then... God can use you for the purpose he has. And he clearly does have a purpose for you. That was a very drastic testimony you had. And uh, I'm sure God has something he wants to do with your life. And I'm sure the enemy wants to put a stop to that. So uh, you should keep pushing forward, pressing in. All right, this is Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, 
and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, by the way, it's not like the Calvinists say. It's not he chose us to be in him. He's chosen us in him. So those that are in him are chosen to be adopted. See, those that are in Christ are chosen to be adopted. He didn't choose us to be in him. That, I believe, was God revealed himself. We believed it. We're not better than anybody else. God didn't any, many, many, mo chose certain people to be lost and saved. He died for everyone. And I think it's a misunderstanding of God's sovereignty versus man's will. He does have a will. There are things in scripture proving that man has a will. He can choose to not do God's will. It grieves God. But ultimately, in God's sovereignty, he does use it all for his purposes. He still gets his will done always in the, in the end. It's just... I, that's a long conversation, but I think these verses are, um, uh, have, have, there's been a lot of false teaching on them throughout the years. But the main thing I wanted you to see is that according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We should be holy and without blame. I can't be holy or without blame on my merits. No matter how good I'm living. So when he's chosen us in him, it's because we're in him that we're holy and without blame. Not because of us. Having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, Wherein is the main point. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. In whom? Now, who's the beloved? It's Jesus. He has made us accepted in the beloved. Do you see? We're accepted because of who we are in. Not, not you know, you aren't accepted. I'm not accepted on my own uh, position because of me or anything I've done. I'm only accepted in the beloved because I'm in Christ by faith. I'm accepted. It's the same thing for every person. We're accepted in the beloved. That's why it's the only way we have to be in Christ. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Now, that's what he's talking about between uh, talking about Gentiles being grafted in. Uh, so you can see here, this is a nice chapter about it being on Jesus's merit, holy and without blame before him in love. Uh, that we are accepted in the beloved. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So stay on that foundation, always praising God, thanking him for so great a salvation. And you'll see the rest will come. The rest will come, but keep your eyes on Jesus. The best thing I, I use the thing with uh, Peter uh, walking on the water is a little like metaphor for that. And I, I tell them when people, when you start getting doubtful, you know, my Savior, you need to think about Peter. The minute he took his eyes off of Jesus, he sank. Okay. It's the same thing here. He looked at the storm, got fear and started sinking. He looked at him. We're the storm. We don't look at us. We're the storm that's going to make us sink. Okay. So stop looking at you and look at Jesus. He will keep you up walking on the water. And that's, it's a good visual to help you remember, hey, wait a minute, what am I basing my salvation on, me or, or him? It's got to be based on him. 
not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness of God, which is by faith. It's by faith in Jesus. It's, it's all him, man. It's just all him. And you stay on that foundation, you're going to be just fine. So anyway, I hope uh, I hope it blessed you guys. And Travis, I uh, welcome here. Uh, we are very happy to have you. Okay. God bless.